morning, church, and praise the Lord. Yeah, my name is Susan Kongo, and our reading for today will come from the book of First John, chapter 4, from verse 7 to 21. If you're using the church Bible, it is in page 961. First John, chapter 4, from verse 7 to 21. And we'll read, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, in this is love, not, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us, if anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has, sorry, for he who does not love his brother, who he has seen, cannot love God, who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And that is the word of the Lord. Good morning. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much, uh, Susan, for reading the word of God ever so clearly to us. And uh, yeah, my name is Gerald. Uh, I am married to Luis, um, and together we have uh, brother. We have we have three children. We have uh, Jeremiah and Daniel and James, who keeps us busy when we are not in church here. Uh, well, even when we are in church here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, so today we are taking a detour on what we've been looking at, the book of Hebrew. Um, and in essence, it's not a detour. In terms of text, we are looking at something different. We are coming to the first book of John. And uh, Pastor Fidel, last week, he finished, uh, or rather, he, he, he had a text there for us in Hebrews 13 there, and talked to us a few things, and he connected to what we are going to do today. Uh, well, I took that as a cue that this is a text you're supposed to deal with next Sunday. Um, he talked about love, if you remember, and he introduced this, um, uh, this, uh, this text that we are, we are going to deal with uh, today uh, by reading verse 7 there. And before we do that, can we pray? Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning for giving us um, a chance uh, to come and read your word, and as we read, Lord, we pray that we be encouraged of what we are doing, we be rebu rebuked uh, for what we are not doing, and Lord, we be encouraged, Lord, to soldier on, to continue with what you have called us to do. The way you are loved affects 
the way you love others. If you're feeling welcomed, nurtured, encouraged, it has a profound way in how you look at your neighbor. It has a, an effect on your behavior towards other people. It has a profound effect on whether you are fearful, whether uh, you are timid or not. The way you are loved affects how you treat people around yourself. And this is really what John is saying. I think the meat of this text we, we have been uh, reading here is found in verse 19, which says to us, he says that we love because he first loved us. We love because he first uh, loved us. If you understand yourself as someone who is truly loved, accepted, and that you have a permanent uh, place in God's family, that he is committed to you, then you will in, that will inevit uh, inevitably affect how you love and treat people around you. And that's the logic of the text before us this morning. I hope you will be able to read with us through that text. But we have started this book at the center of it. And it's good for us to get a, a bit of a background. I don't have much time, but I will try to tease a little bit about the background of this book. Who is John? Who is he writing to? And why is he writing to them? Now, the same person who has written the first book of John is the same person who wrote the book of John. I hope that does not confuse you. But at the first book that he wrote to them, the first of book of John, he is calling them to faith. Come and see the master. Come and see Jesus who he is. Believe in him. Have eternal life. Walk with your friends as you walk towards Jesus. But this particular book, John comes to them and tells them, I know you believed in Jesus. Well and good. And he wants to encourage them to continue doing what they are doing. Now, he is writing to a group of people who were not divided. Uh, there was a faction. Factions did not start uh, today. Factions has been there for many years. But in this particular society, that uh, another group he is writing to, there was a faction. There are people who had left the church and gone somewhere else. And the people who had remained were looking at the people who had gone and were wondering, is there something we are missing? We see that in uh, chapter, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse, verse, I think verse 19, uh, we, we, we read there, uh, we hear John uh, saying, uh, what does he say? They went out of us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. Now, this group that had moved away were teaching things that were making people who had remained to doubt about their faith, their walk with God. How do we know that? We see that in verse 20 of the same chapter, we hear uh, uh, John saying, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. It would sound like there was somebody who is saying you do not know the real truth. You have not really experienced God as you ought to. Verse 27, something else is said there. What does it say? It says, as for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches all uh, it teaches you about all things and that that anointing is real, not a counterfeit, just as it has taught you. Remain in him. So it sounds John is coming here to tell them, forget about what they are teaching you. You are in the right course. You are in the right course. So John is telling them here, in essence, don't go anywhere. Now, the book itself has three highlights I want to bring to us today. John has read out. the first one is that he commends them for believing in Jesus. He commends them for believing in Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God. They believed. Look at you guys. You believe the truth, truth about Jesus. 
that he is the son of God. He is the Messiah who died for you. Don't you believe that? Great. That is a sure sign that you are true believers. Forget about the group that moved. You are true believers. You are God's people. That's one thing. He commends them for believing in Jesus, that he is the son of God. Secondly, he recognize, that they recognize the problem of sin, and they are turning away from their sins. And they are seeking to obey God. It's well and good. You believe Jesus is the son of God. You are, you are actually turned away from your sin, and you are actually doing your best to follow him. That's another second uh, sure sign that you are genuine believers. You are not a counterfeit. But the third th that thing that he tells them, or rather commends them for, is their love for their Christian brothers and sisters. Of course, I know you're not doing the best. You are, you are attempting to do your, your, your best. But continue in loving and caring for people around you. Now, we do not have enough time to look at how he, dealt, he deals with that. But he does that three, three times in the book. He does that three times in the book. We first see that in, first, uh, 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 in chapter 1, verse uh, 5, through uh, chapter 2, verse 28. He says it once. He says it the second time. That is chapter 2, verse 29, to uh, chapter 4, verse 26. Um, and now, he comes again to say to say it one more time. That's a measure of a good teacher, isn't it? Says it once, says it the second time, and says that I have said it. So he is coming here the third time to say that. But also we do know from other history that John is an old man. Now those people who don't listen to us there, they need to hear this. <laughs> men, old men, have wisdom we don't have. And sometimes we, they talk, we don't listen. Yeah? Many times we don't. Actually, we say, hey, you know, but we do know that this book is written around 85 AD. Don't want to bother you with history. But it's written during that time. And if John is born the same time with Jesus, it makes him an old man. So he has a bit of wisdom that we need to listen to. Now in this section, it is capped a lot with a lot of wisdom. The text that was read to us is what we are coming to. And here he has deals with the theme of loving God and loving people. John is saying that actually, he is actually bringing to us about the theme of loving God and loving people. And that's the text I was given to, to deal with. Now, if knowing God, rather, uh, can I make this statement? That knowing God starts from knowing that God is love. Now, that's the theme we've been running around through the, through the year. Now, knowing God, I want you to hold that one. Knowing God means that you know God is love. And that's what John is going to tell us. Now, when we talk about love, when we go to text that talks about love in the Bible, I think most of us will run to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, isn't it? About love in weddings, we do that. But when I was given this job, I looked at some of the text, and I actually saw that the book, this section talks more about love than any other part of scripture. 27 times my version in 15 verses. That almost makes it about twice in every, in every sentence, or rather in every verse. So it means it is big here, and we want to tease out and see what is John trying to tell us. Now, it, seems, it, would, it would seem that John, as he is, as he is addressing this question about love, about loving God and loving people around you, that he addresses three questions. Remember we said that this is a group that was in doubt and were wondering whether they are in the right course, whether they are following God as they ought to. And John writes this text, to, seems to me, to address three questions. One question is, where did the love come from? The second one is that how do you show love? Or how, rather, how does God show us love? But also the third thing is that how is that love made complete? Three questions. How did, it, how did love come from? Where did love come from? Where, how does God show us love? But also how is love 
made complete. And in doing that, he wants us to understand, to have a better understanding of who God is. And not just to understand uh, uh, about how, who God is, but also to help us, to inspire us, to persevere in loving others. So let's deal with those questions. Question number one, where did love come from? Where did love come from? Verse uh, 7 and 8 says, Dear friends, let us love one another. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and, and knows God. Whoever does not love does not go, know God because God is love. I hope I'm not shouting. Uh, Louise and I, we are teachers, and we say we are paid to teach. So we are paid to talk. So sometimes when in our talking, we shout, and our boys tell me, you're shouting. Um, so I hope uh, I'm not shouting at uh, anyone's ear. Um, but the verses here before us are actually telling us that love comes from God. God is the source. So if they had any doubt, where did love come from? He is saying that love's from God. And that God is essentially love. Verse 7, dear friends, let us love one another, for, God, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. If there were in any doubt where did love come from, it comes from God. Now, what are we saying here? We are saying that God is essentially love himself. And love ultimately comes from God. So I want with, to, you to move with me in that logic. That love is not one of the many things that God can do. Of course, he is patient, he is faithful, all those things. He, do, he does that, those things. But love is what he is. And essentially, it flows from him. He is the source of love. And I think here John is saying, for us to have authentic, real love, we must be connected to God because he is the source. Love is embedded in who he is. Now, we have different concepts of God. And if any understanding of God fails to understand that God is loving is a wrong understanding of God. If anyone fails to understand that God is love, that's a wrong concept of God. How can this be? It means that if you're talking to somebody and they're talking about God being a distant God, God who is unconcerned, God who is unbothered because of the things they are going through. And I know we are all, in, a, in one stage of our lives, we are going through hard stuff in our lives. We have lost dear ones. We have lost jobs. We have been chased away by landlords and landladies because we haven't been able to, to pay our arrears. We don't have money to pay for our school fees for our children. We want to do that, we don't have that. We have illnesses. I know, we are terminally ill. We have things that are bothering and bogging us down. And sometimes, it is, it is easier for us to look at the God who is unconcerned. God who allows these things to do. I know this is a big theme. How does God allow suffering? Where was God when this happened to me? And sometimes we can have a wrong concept of who God is. But here John is saying, if your understanding of God is one that is unloving, one who is unconcerned, one who is distant, like our Kikuyu concept of God, who lives in the mountains and not bothered about small people down here, if that is your understanding, then you have a wrong understanding of God. Now, have you forgotten what James says in, John, uh, in James uh, chapter 1, verse 2? He verse two? says, Consider pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, it's very hard for us to, to consider joy when we are going through this hard stuff, isn't it? 
Currently, we have the floods that have swept homes and families. People have been left homeless, lost dear ones. And he's saying, consider them pure joy when you go through those kinds of suffering. Now, here also James is saying, God is love. And sometimes God does allow us to go some of the stuff to make us stronger. Now, can I make a disclaimer here that not all the suffering, pain, and suffering that you go through are from God? A subject of another day. But here, James and, and John here are almost saying something close to, you know, when you have sportsmen who are, want to build muscles, one of the things they do is to lift weights, isn't it? Hey. They go out into the gym or wherever they lift up weights, and that lifting the weight tears down the muscles. And it causes pain and strain to the body. Now the muscles are torn. Now, myself, uh, I'm not in our field of understanding that science, but I'm told that as the muscles grow, they become stronger. That's why you see somebody after lifting those things after a few, few days, uh, that their uh, body are transformed. And that's the idea here. That some of those things, they come, they stretch us. And as we come, we continue to grow and to love God, we become stronger in our faith and in our love for our God. So John here is well helping us to understand that God is a source of love. Now, if we understand that, that God is love, if we know God and we understand that God is love, what is it supposed to, to, to do? We need to, first of all, if we want to understand uh, love, we need, first of all, to look at God. That God is fundamentally love and that he rules and love in a loving way. He judges in a loving way. He disciplines in a loving way. Now, let's teach a little bit about discipline. How do we discipline our children? We do we do that in a loving way? Sometimes we punish them, we discipline them because of anger, isn't it? We want to hit them because, oh goodness, you are doing that. How can you do that? Sometimes we fly off the handle. You know, mtoto ame ame ruka hapa anapata kiboko. Parents like myself, sometimes we get angry, isn't it? But God does not punish us that way. He does that in a loving way. And I want you to understand that. As we are saying, we are going through some of those things, that God does that in a loving way. Why? Because he is loving. He judges us in a loving way. He is constant. It's not some, sometimes that God is more angry than, uh, than he's never been before. Any anger, any sin that we commit, God punishes it. Now, sometimes we say, I'll teach you a lesson. That's anger, isn't it? You have done that. I'll teach you a lesson. And sometimes we are heavy-hearted in our discipline, in our anger. But throughout the, the New Testament, God is presented to us as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Father who loves Son and the Holy Spirit. Son who loves the Father and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit who loves the Father and the Son. So essentially, they are bowed together by love. And that's the point John is trying to make, up, uh, to make it here, or rather to, to, pre, uh, to give it out here very clearly to us, that he is essentially love. It is not one of, the things, uh, one of the other things that God can do, but essentially, God is love. Now, we are supposed also to understand, therefore, that Christian faith is not a solitary activity. Where you become faith, you have faith, and your Bible. Sunday, church, and you go back home. But actually, being a Christian is called to that community. And that's, where we are, that's the point now we are driving. That when you become a believer, you do not just believe in God and experience that love of God. But that love of God is supposed to, extend it, to be extended to others. And particularly, people of, this, of your faith. People of Christian faith. Because God is love. Now, if we understand that God is compassionate, he is affectionate, he is patient, he is in the working for the good of others, 
Have we not just read that about Jesus himself, that he dies on the cross, suffers and goes through the pain and died and rose again for the good of others, good of you and I? If that is a concept we have about God, then that should start to rub off in our lives. It should be seen in how I deal with my friend. And here, John is almost making a point. Christian maturity, it is not measured by how much you know about Scripture. It is not, it is not measured by how many jargons you know about theology. It is not measured by how eloquent you are or how clear you are in your, in your stuff. But actually, the measure of maturity here is love. Christian maturity is made, measured by how much you love. And that is to say that God is love, and that's all he does, love in us. And if that is the case, then that should be seen in me and you, love in others. So that's the first question he was addressing. He seems, how, or rather, where did love come from? The second question he deals with is, how do you show love? How do you show love? Verse 9, we read, uh, uh, we read, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his son, his one and only son, into the world that we might live through him. Now, he is going back to your friend who was telling, them that, who was telling you that they are going through hard stuff. He is telling them that God is love. Tell them God is love. But God is not just mere words. As human beings, we are very good in promises, isn't it? It was just mere words, isn't it? Just be our, I'm going to make your life better. But you don't. But God does not just say, I am love. But God does demonstrate that to us, that he is love. And how does he do that? He says in verse 9, this is how God shows uh, his love among us. He sent his son and only son in the world that we might live through him. He goes through pain and sorrow so that you and I can have a better, uh, uh, better uh, relationship with our Father. What does that mean? He means God is demonstrating. Now, if I told you today that I can do a 42-kilometer 40, uh, run here, some of you will be looking at me and thinking, mm, uh, I don't know about that. The only way I can prove to you is to get my shoes on, hit the road, 45, 42 kilometers is done, and stand, and you say, oh, yes, you can do it. It is by demonstration, isn't it? Now here is what the point John is making here. God is not just love, but he has demonstrated to us that he is love by dying on the cross. And God does not just demonstrate that to us in a simple way, but in one of the most dramatic ways. One, that love of God is undeserved. Look at verse, uh, verse 10. What does it say? It says that this is, love, uh, this is love, that not that we loved God, but that he first loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It is undeserved, isn't it? It is undeserved. You did not, you did not deserve it. I did not deserve it. Yet he dies. How do we love as human beings? We love people who are like us. We love people who, who, have, uh, um, uh, who have hobbies like us, music, football. If you're an Arsenal fan, uh, last night it was good. Um, uh, Chelsea fan, <laughs> I don't know. We, don't, we, we like people who are like us, people who like things like we do. We like people, mostly, sadly. We like people of the same color like ourselves. If we are darker, we probably like people who are darker like us. Uh, if we are lighter, we like people who are lighter like us. We like people of our same tribe, isn't it? We like people I can speak to Kikuyu, Kikuyu with. You know, it's easy. There's no struggle in communication, isn't it? Yeah. If your language is only English, you say, oh, oh, oh it's a struggle to communicate. Or, we, we struggle, isn't it? We like people who like food like us. I love chapatis. And people who have love chapatis here are uh, one of my family. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand how you can't love chapatis. We love people who are like us. We love people who is natural to love. You know, 
yeah, I don't want somebody who is telling me that Jesus is not coming tomorrow. Yeah, I want somebody who is telling me, oh no, I don't want somebody who is telling me about Jesus coming tomorrow. No, 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 I don't believe that. We love people who are aligned like us. But look at how different this is from love of God. God himself loves, to, uh, loves us not because we, we, we loved him. We are actually arrogant. We think highly of ourselves. I think I come from this family. We are well there. You come from what sort of family? You tell me. No, I, I, we think highly of ourselves. I have more education than you do. I have a better job than yourself. We think highly of ourselves. In fact, when we, in relation to God, we have despised him. We have denied him. What do we do him? ultimately? We hang him on the cross. He is not us. We are ungrateful. But yet, God loves us. We despised him. We ignored him. And we continue to do that today. We continue to do that today. But yet, Jesus, God, loves us anyway. So that's one shocking thing. It's undeserved. But secondly, it is sacrificial love. The same verse when we read it. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, the word atoning there is not very helpful. Now you know that uh, uh, SIL. It's not very helpful in our language. <laughs> it seems like a hard word, isn't it? What is atoning? What is atoning? What does it mean? But in essence, what, what, uh, what John is saying is that this word, God, his wrath, has been satisfied. Now, because of our arrogance, ignorance, forsaking God, his wrath was on us. But God says, I have a solution. Jesus himself will take your place. So he comes and, and takes your place. Now, you, uh, we, will not, we will not have survived his wrath. But yet God, uh, Jesus himself, takes it. So that is sacrificial. He satisfied God's wrath. And in doing so, ourselves we become one with God. We become one with God. We are welcomed to God's uh, family. That's sacrificial love, isn't it? That Jesus himself dies on the cross for you and I so that ourselves we might experience that. And that is the ultimate demonstration of what love is. To give your life for the good of others. Here, John is saying, that actually, Jesus himself is not just, or rather, God himself is not just love, but he has demonstrated through the life, of, through the, the life uh, and the death of Jesus himself. But how does that look? How do we demonstrate love to us, uh, to our neighbors, to our friends and people around us? John is asking. And I think uh, our pastor last week started teasing out a little bit about love. And one of the things he mentioned to us is in scripture about the life of people like Dorcas. Giving their life and their resources for the well-being and survival of others. Are you doing that yourself? Are you opening your doors like he challenged us last Sunday to strangers? Now, I know in Nairobi we fear strangers, isn't it? One thing we see, when we see a stranger, he is probably a thief or not somebody good at all, isn't it? So we fear strangers. But actually here, John is saying, even welcoming strangers. We do not know what they are going to do to you, but you open strangers. Other scripture doesn't know, tell us that when we open our doors to strangers, we might be welcoming who? The angels. It means not holding things to ourselves. There are people, if you open their door like this, their house door like this, things will start falling off before you even step into the house. They have accumulated things they do not need. What John is saying here is that open your door as your friends and strangers come to the door. You see their needs. Oh, you can have that shoe. You can have that dress. And sometimes when we give, we give what does not concern us, isn't it? Are you okay? But John is saying that we sacrificially give to others. It is the practical, sacrificial demonstration of love that Jesus himself does that. He gives his... Have we not read? 
God gives his one and only. Scripture is very clear. One and only. I like that some of that language. It's very clear. One and only. If anything happened to him, that was it. Of course, God knew what would happen, isn't it? <laughs> that he will die for you and I. That is a pure demonstration of love. Uh, uh, practical, sacrificial service to humanity. But the third and the last question he seemed to be addressing was the question of how is love made complete? How is love made complete? Look at it with me, verse 12. What does it say? No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Verse 17, he says, This is how love is made complete among us, so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. If this world, in this world, we are like Jesus. Now, if you're studying those two verses, it sounds strange, isn't it? That the word, it will be made complete, it will be made complete. And you can actually wonder, what has Gerald been saying? He's been saying that love is complete. The source is God. Now, what is this verse are they saying? Are they saying something different from what he is saying? But John actually, he is not saying that God's love is not complete. But the intention of God's love is not so that we receive love and keep it to us. But that love, it is made complete by how we live and treat people around us. It does not say that Jesus' love is not, God's love is not complete. But he says that when we receive love, we also show us uh, love. Um, God's love, God's intention for love, it is that that love may start to overflow in your life, may start to be seen uh, towards other people. So we do not go keep hold of things that we, we have, but we actually do for the well-being and the life of others. It is supposed to be demonstrated. I said we are taking a detour, but it's the same message. From what we, we learned uh, last week about hospitality, you know, I hope you do understand, most of us do understand, the whole Bible itself is one story, isn't it? So as you hope from one, you hear the same message, probably said in different words. That our, actually, our love it should be demonstrated in how we treat uh, people around us. Uh, through generosity, through hospitality, through general care, through forgiveness. And sometimes we wonder, how do I show love to my neighbor? who never even say hi to me. Anakuona unakuja hivi ye naenda hivi. Anajipa shuguli. Ama kama ama ni wewe labda. Una, oh, ni jirani, hey. How do we look at people who are not like us? Hey, wale, how? Sindio? That's how we say, oh, them, oh, they don't eat like us. Oh, no, oh, they are too complicated. We like a simple life. How do we treat people, members, ourselves here? You know, when we come from different societies, different classes of people, different levels of education. How do we treat people who we have absolutely nothing in common? That's a measure. How do we treat people from different tribes, culture, and country, and so on? Hmm? na niambia ni waite kwangu nyumbani. Na ile kitu najua kupika tu ni ugali. Na wanasemanga hao hakulangi ugali. Sasa wakikuja kweli nitafanya nini? Wacha wakae. Yeah, here they don't eat ugali. So why, how am I going to invite me to my house? I can't, I can't. You treble, isn't it? We fear. Wacha tukutane kwa kanisa. But here John is saying, I know, I know it's hard. I know it's hard for you to invite people you don't speak the same language. I know it's hard. It's tough. I know it's tough when you bring people who do not have share with your ideologies at all. They, I know it's tough. But he is saying, the shocking thing he is saying, that as you do that, as you persevere in loving others, we say it, God is love, and therefore if God is love, then that should be demonstrated. He says, as you do those hard, difficult things, two things will happen. One is that the world will see. The world will see. Again, we read verse 12. He says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete 
in us. Praise the Lord. As we love other people, people who don't believe in the gospel, we start to see. Hey, and I never think about Jalu Hapo. See how you are going to go to Kenya? Aya, ata wakamba wana kunyanga yu nyumba. Eh, wakamba by the way mungu wana wapenda. Hey, ata wazungu wana kujanga huko. Hey, ata wa Afrika wana kunyanga kwa yu nyumba. Isn't it? People start to see there's something special in you. And here John is saying, as we are doing that, we are making the gospel of Jesus believable to other people. They start to see a glimpse of what the eternal kingdom it is. We read that in Revelation, isn't it? People from different tongues and tribes, from different nations, isn't it? People of different color, yellow, black, white. Have you met people who are yellow? And black? The yellow people probably say, I've never met a black person. Um, when I lived in the United Kingdom, children used to come down the street and touch my hair, asking whether it's real. <laughs> my wife here happens to, the same thing happens to her. Mm, is she a toy or something? Is she? Yeah. It says, as we do that, people start to see that actually to have a glimpse of God, uh, God's love. They start to believe in the Bible itself. But the second thing that happened, shocking thing that happened, we will be sure ourselves. Verse 17. We will be sure ourselves. What does it say? This is, this is how, you know, you, how love is made complete in us so that as we have confidence, we will have confidence of the day of judgment. This is the world. We are like Jesus. We will have confidence in the return of the king. We will have that. We will have that. Now, God himself... Now, by the way, note that part. The last part of that portion says, we, in this world, we are like Jesus. You're not Jesus. You're like Jesus. And we have been told about Jesus himself. What have we been told? That he practically demonstrated his love to us by dying and suffering on the cross so that ourselves we may be connected to God. Sacrificially gave his life. So what? The writer is saying, when he is saying we are like Jesus, he is asking the question, are you demonstrating that love like Jesus did? Are you showing that great love for the well-beings of others? Are you practically demonstrating that and say, oh yeah, you are more important than myself. Come and sit. I will look for somewhere else. Kuna watu, by the way, wakika chini huwezi kamuamusha. Sindio? Nilikuja mbele. Wewe kwa nini masaa ulikuwa wapi? <laughs> they want to feel important. They are imp and indeed probably they are important. I have no doubt about that. But I am saying that here we are being told sacrificial love. Things that are entitled for you. What I'm actually saying here is that there are things that are entitled for you. But here, Jesus himself, he is entitled to stay in heaven. And for us to grapple with our sins and our ignorance. Yet he sacrificially left that. First thing we see, he is born in a major. He doesn't come riding, uh, riding horses and chariots, say, oh, king. You know, like the British came to Kenya. You know, they sang, they breathed the trumpet. We are here. No, Jesus does not come that way. And the Kikuyu, as we go to Samburu and other places, we say, we are here. We have learned well, isn't it? Our art of intimidating other people as well. No. Here he's saying, there are things that are entitled for you, but you give for the well-being of others. You take a back seat, and that's a challenge for us today. Jesus himself demonstrated his love for you in a most profound, dramatic way by sending his son to die for you and I. You did not deserve it. You did not earn it. And that's my, the message to myself as well. I did not deserve it, and I did not earn it. So knowing God, as we conclude, knowing God is knowing that God is love. And it's not just knowing that God is love. Our lives must be evident that the love of God lives and dwells in us. So knowing God starts from knowing that he is love. But for that love to be made complete, 
It must be seen in how I see you. Your love for God must be seen in how you treat me. It must be seen on how. Actually, that's the measure. We are saying that's a measure of Christianity, how you love. How you love God and how you love people around you. That's a measure of Christian faith. Now, as we begin to understand that, our lives start to be transformed and people outside there, you know, there are people who say, no, I can't preach like, uh, like Pastor Fidel or Pastor Harrison here. Yeah, no, 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 those things are not, I'm not made for that. No one was made for that, by the way. God does bring some of those gifts to, to us. Well, actually, yeah, there are people who are actually made to be preachers, isn't it? <laughs> uh, and there are people who are just made to be followers, good followers. But he is saying here that our lives must be seen, evident of God's love in our lives must be seen on how I love people around us. And that is the gist of what we've been saying here for those 40 minutes. That actually, knowing God is knowing that he is love, and it's not just knowing that it is receiving. But there are people who are good in receiving gifts, but very bad in giving them. Christmas is coming, isn't it? We will receive a lot of gifts. And I see that with my children. We receive a lot of gifts. But they say, give me. Mm, no, no. It's human, isn't it? We put them close to ourselves. Hey, Fagia, wanakuja. Weka hapa kwa store, kwanza. Because the idea is not to share what we have received. But here he's saying, share what you have received. And that is love. That sees that transformation in your life. In verse 19, I'll read it through to verse 21. He says, if we love, we love because we, he first loved us. Because he first loved us. We were unlovable. It is undeserved. It is actually sacrificial. In any case, what we deserved was the wrath of God to be poured on us. Yet, it was sacrificial. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates his, his brother and sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brothers and sister whom they can see cannot love God whom they have not seen. Are you that kind of a person who is actually saying that I love God but I hate my neighbor? I hate my brother and sister? The Bible says there you actually can't love God at all whom you have not seen. Verse 21, and he that given us this command, uh, and he has given this, this, us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The Lord bless you.